Three years ago, when we started our church, the very first Sunday, we began in John 1. And over the course of three years, we have explored its depths. We have submerged into its glories. We've behold, we, we've, we've looked at our glorious Savior, the, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is light and the one who is life. A couple weeks ago, we had a really big ending to the Gospel of John, and now we're kind of having this um, very soft conclusion to John's Gospel. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So starting in verse 15, follow along in your Bible as I read. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him for a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, What is it to you? You follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Let's go ahead and pray and ask for the Lord's help, and then we will take apart this text this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you needy, hungry, and I ask this morning that as we conclude our study of John's gospel, as we look at these verses, that you would powerfully work through your spirit to convict, to illuminate hearts. If there's anyone in here this morning who is not one of your own, that you would draw them to yourself this morning. Help me to get out of the way of the passage and make your word preeminent and your glory our focus. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the Gospel of John really came to a conclusion in chapter 20, where you have the resurrection appearances and the climactic confession from Thomas that Jesus is both Lord and God. And you'll remember a couple of weeks ago when we looked at that text that the Apostle John then says, therefore, as a reader, that's the word. I know, remember, we parked on this for a little while. The ESV doesn't say therefore, but the word is therefore. Therefore, I've written these things to you so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ The Christos, the anointed one, the Savior, it's not his last name, Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And if the Gospel of John ends there, then it ends on the mountain peak. You're you're on the summit. For the entirety of the Gospel, you have ascended this mountain of information And now with this confession from Thomas's lips that Jesus is his Lord and his God, we're on the top, we're taking it in, and John tells us, I've written this so that way you would do the very same thing. And it feels like John's gospel comes to a conclusion, that it ends on a high note. But then, you'll notice, it doesn't come to a conclusion. There's a 21st chapter in John's gospel, and the mountaintop is gone. 
We're no longer on a peak. We're in a valley, it would seem. We're back to ordinary life. We're not in Jerusalem anymore. The disciples are not together. The family's been separated. They're not in the upper room anymore. No, we're, we're back. Gone is gospel ministry. Gone is all of the, the glories of the past three years. No, we are back to a few disciples. And they're in Galilee. And they're fishing. It's a jarring scene shift. And it is a perplexing ending to John's gospel. It almost seems like it's out of place, like it was just randomly tacked on there, and there are many critical scholars who believe that very thing. The problem is that there are no copies of John's gospel from the earliest manuscripts that don't include 21, so this is just a far-fetched fantasy from critics. And yet you and I have to wonder why John chooses to bring his gospel to a conclusion with this anticlimactic uneventful ending. Jesus has demonstrated many signs. He's lived in perfect obedience. He died a substitutionary death. He was resurrected from the tomb. His ascension into heaven will occur in just a couple of pages in the book of Acts. But before the church is born, Pentecost, something has to be done. There's unfinished business in our story. The man who will become the church's leader, Peter, is still living in shame. He needs to be restored. This is the reason why John 21 is here. It is an epilogue. Uh, if you have a bulletin, there's a handout, and there's an outline of John's gospel in the handout. John's gospel is masterfully laid out with a prologue at the beginning, summarizing the entire themes of the gospel. Then you have the gospel's body, which is split into two parts. The first half is uh, the signs of the Messiah. The second half is the passion uh, of the Messiah or of the Savior. And then to balance it out, John includes an epilogue at the end. Think of it as a, as a post-credit scene in a movie. Last week, Ethan preached on verses 1 through 14 with the fishing and the providing and the intentional imagery about God equipping you and I for mission. But like I said earlier, there is still unfinished business and Peter must be restored to mission. So let's get into it as we look at Peter's commission in verse 15 through 17. When they Look with me at your Bibles at verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? No, notice that Jesus calls Peter Simon, son of John. There is a, a seriousness about this. There's formality here. He's addressing him by his full title. He's not just calling him by his name. He's saying Simon, son of John. It would be something like uh, Joshua Michael Valdez or um, I don't know, whatever title. I guess I'm a pastor, Pastor Josh Valdez. It, there, there's a, a solemnness here. But not only is there formality and seriousness in Jesus' title for Peter, there's also sweetness here. As a beautiful bookend, this final address to Peter in John's gospel matches Jesus' first address to Peter when he calls him for the first time into ministry. And that accounts all the way in the first chapter of John's gospel in John 1, verse 40 through 42. It reads like this. One of the two who heard John speak, that's John the Baptist, who was not Baptist, uh, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ, which means Savior. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, Now this is Jesus. He's talking to Peter for the first time. He says, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas. And then the apostle John adds a little explanatory note for us, which means Peter. So after this serious and sweet address, Jesus has Peter's attention. He doesn't call him Peter. He calls him by the very name that he called him when he called him into ministry. He asks him a question. Do you love me more than these? 
And as Bible readers, we have to ask ourselves, what are the these to which Jesus is referring? Some commentators suggest that Jesus is asking Peter if he loves him more than he loves the other disciples. In other words, Peter, am I your highest love? Other commentators say that Jesus is asking Peter uh, if he loves him, if Jesus, if Peter loves Jesus more than he loves his fish or his fishing gear. In other words, do you love me, Peter, more than you love your job? This interpretation, and I've heard this interpretation most commonly, it makes this whole passage inherently negative. It implies that Peter and the other disciples, after having the resurrection in John 20, now are backsliding in their faith, and they've given up on ministry, and they've returned to their secular occupation, and they're there. And so Jesus shows up and says, Peter, do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than your livelihood? And and right here at the beginning, I want you to understand that that is not what is going on here. The disciples' fishing is not negative. So many messages you've probably heard, I've heard, are built off of this faulty assumption that the discouraged disciples return to their non-ministry lives in a regressive, faith-filling act. And we'll counter this interpretation of this passage all throughout the message this morning. But for now, just know that these disciples fishing in Galilee is not some sort of regression, not some sort of apostasy, not some sort of discouragement where they're leaving ministry and doing their thing. What they are doing is exactly what they were commanded to do. In Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 28, we read that both the angel at the tomb and Jesus himself gave these men the command to go home. Go back home to Galilee. That's Matthew 28, 5 through 10, if you want to jot that down for your notes. So they're not, they're not faltering in faith. They're actually faithfully obeying because both an angel and Jesus told them, you go home to Galilee and you wait for me. The, this common, the common understanding of John 21 is that these men have faltered in their faith. But there is a much better understanding than that. This whole passage is about Peter's public restoration to ministry. And this is going to help us in our interpretation this morning. So when Jesus asks Peter if he loves him more than these He isn't referring to the other disciples. Do you love me more than you love them? He isn't referring to the fish or the fishing equipment. Do you love me more than your job? Do you you love me more than your secular job? No, he's asking Peter this. Do you love me more than these disciples do? Do you love me more than these men love me? And you say, that's an odd question on Jesus' part. But if you remember what has transpired the night that Peter faltered, you will see that this is an intentional callback on Jesus' part. What he's doing, and it's beautiful and it's masterful, he is repeating and recreating specifics on the night that Peter fell. I want to take you back to the Last Supper and the farewell discourse. And it was typical of Peter's character to be boisterous and and to be bragging. But on the night that he betrayed Jesus at the Last Supper before he did it, he boasted of his love for Jesus. He stood up in front of the rest of the disciples and said, "I, I basically love you more than these do. This is what he says in John 13, 36 to 38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. In Mark's account of that very same dinner, we read that Peter says this in Mark 14, 29. Peter said to him, even though they fall away, as in the other 11 apostles, well, in that case, there'd be 10 because Judas was gone already. Even if these men fall away, I will not. Matthew's account in Matthew 26, 33, Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
Do you see what Jesus is doing here? When he asks him, Peter, do you love me more than these men do? It's a callback. It's a callback to the night when he was betrayed where Peter boasted of his love for Jesus more, his love and his faithfulness to Jesus more than the other disciples. Continue on looking at the verse here. He says, he said to him, Peter's response, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him for the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? There, are, there is a lot going on here. There is a threefold address. Jesus addresses Peter three times as Simon, son of John. There is a threefold question. Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. There's a threefold response. Peter tells Jesus that he loves him. And then there is a threefold command. Jesus tells Peter to feed his sheep. Three times, Jesus calls Peter, Simon, son of John. Three times, he asks him if he loves him. Three times, Peter says, I I love you. And then three times, Jesus says, feed my sheep. And there has been a lot of ink spilled about this exact exchange. Uh, Last week, when I was heading up to Montrose, Colorado, going over Red Mountain Pass uh, while my dad was keeping us on the road, because if you know that, that treacherous journey, you know you could fly right off that thing. So he's keeping us on the road, and I've got my stack of commentaries in the back, and the print's like this big, and I'm making my, myself, I would say making myself sick, but I don't, I don't get motion sickness. But for, for, exag- for preacher exaggeration this morning, just to make you feel, I made myself sick <laughs> studying for you about reading all of the interpretations here. And I'm guessing if you've been in a church for some time, you have heard this sermon preached. I guarantee if you've been in church any amount of time, this this has come up. You go to camp, Christian camp, this comes up. Revival meeting, this comes up. You just just can't get away from this text. It's always coming at you, and, and, and you've heard an exposition of the passage. There are two key words used for love in this exchange between Peter and Jesus. And some of you, you already know where I'm going. You, you've heard this before. I guarantee you, you have not. So don't check out yet. There's two words in this text that are used for the word love. You say, I don't see two words. I just see love. Yes, the ESV translates it as love, thankfully. And you'll see why in a second. The first word is the word, you've heard this, is what? I mean, if you've been to church, it's what? It's agape, right? It's agape, it's, which means love. A lot of times but not all the time, sometimes even, let's just say sometimes. Sometimes in the New Testament, it's used to describe God's love for the Father, the Son's love for the the Father, God's love for people. So some people, the interpretation I'm guessing you've heard, I'm not trying to throw your preacher that you grew up under under the bus, but maybe I am. It goes something like, um, agape love is Christian love. It's high love. It's self-sacrificial, godly love. So that's, a, that's what they say. That's the first term. The second term is the word phileo, which you say sounds like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And that is correct. The word phileo means not so much, uh, it kind of has this idea of affection, friendship idea. So look, at, look with me now at the exchange in your text. Jesus, the first two times, asks Peter if he agape loves him. Do you love me with the highest, the purest, the godliest love? <coughs> Peter responses, responds by saying, you know that I phileo you, that I love you as a friend. I love you as a brother. Finally, Jesus lowers the demand of love and asks Peter, do you phileo love me? Do you like me, Peter? And Peter says, yes, I do, right? So that's the standard interpretation. You've heard that before. Peter, do you love me with Christian love, godly love? Do you love me with the highest love? And Peter says, I like you. And Jesus says, do you love me like I love you? Like I I sacrifice myself for you with agape love. And Peter says, I like you. And then Jesus says, okay, Peter, do you like me? You like me? And Peter says, I like you. And then the preacher says, imitation time, you got to have agape love, right? We We all heard this. That's not what's going on here. Dead wrong. Take that interpretation and throw it into the Sea of Galilee because it is absolutely wrong. 
John isn't trying to make some sort of theological pronouncement about the nature of love. If you want that, you don't go to the Apostle John. You go to C.S. Lewis in his masterful treatment of this called The Four Loves. Go read that. Peter, Jesus and Peter are not speaking in Greek. Okay, so it's not like Jesus is asking him agape love. And Peter says, you know, phileo love. No, 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 they're not speaking in Greek. They're speaking in Aramaic. John is writing the gospel in Greek. So you say, well, why does John use two different words here for love? Well, as a gifted writer, John incorporates stylistic variety. So we as a reader don't get bored. In John's gospel, he has used both of these terms interchangeably. The father agapes the son, and the son agapes the father. The father phileos the son, and the son phileos the father. So this this passage is not some sort of exercise in Greek terms. There is no hidden meaning here in in the Greek words. That that kind of interpretation, that's like freshman, that's like sophomore Greek. Like, I learned these terms, therefore it means this. So you've heard this before too. This one gets on my nerves. You know, the word for um, like energy in the the Bible is dynamis. It's the Greek term. You've heard this. Some of you are nodding. You know where this is going dynamite, explosion. Uh, There was no dynamite in the New Testament. That's just silly. Okay, so that's not what's going on here. That's not the understanding. That's not the interpretation. So so you say, well, why does Jesus do this? Why does he address Peter three times? Why does he ask him if he loves him three times? Why does he tell him, feed my sheep in response? It's, It's actually really, really simple. You ready for this? Jesus is publicly restoring Peter. That's it. That's all that's going on here. Peter has denied Jesus three times. And Jesus now offers Peter the opportunity to publicly affirm his love for him three times. This conversation is taking place around a charcoal fire. You may have missed that detail when Ethan was preaching last week. That's not an accidental information. That's intentional on John's part that he tells us that they're standing around a charcoal fire. And you say, why is that significant? Because the last time they were standing around a charcoal fire was in John 18. John 18, verse 18. The servants and the officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. And you'll remember when we were back in John 18 that that's intentional. That's an entendre on John's part. Peter is literally in the company of the enemy. Now, John 21, 9, when they got on the land, the disciples, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on and bread. John 18, charcoal fire. Peter's with Christ's enemies, he denies him three times. John 21, charcoal fire. But this time, Peter's not with Christ's enemies. He's with the apostles. And three times now, he's going to publicly affirm his love for Christ. All of this is poetic. There's a rhyming of events. Jesus is intentionally recreating events, recreating scenes, and recreating sayings so that he can recommission and call Peter recall Peter into gospel ministry. And yes, recall can mean like come back, but if you Google it, like the, one of the definitions at the bottom of recall means, I'm not being grammatically incorrect, it means like to recall, like, like I'm calling you again. So, so don't be thinking, oh man, this guy. So it really is that simple, really. Uh, around a coal fire, Peter denies Jesus. Now around a a charcoal fire, Peter affirms Jesus. In the company of enemies, Peter denies Jesus three times. Now around the company of his closest friends, Peter affirms his love for Jesus three times. He is being restored to ministry. Look at what happens next here. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter has not yet caught on to what is happening. So he's grieved. This is the word lipeo. It means to be sorrowful, sad, distressed. He isn't sure 
what Jesus is doing. He's, he's not aware. He's thinking to himself, why are you doing this? He's getting more desperate. You know I love you. Why are you ask? Yes, I love you. I love you. He's feeling embarrassed and sad about this. And again, not incidental that he's feeling grieved. What it tells us is that Peter has changed. Formerly, Peter would have been quick to boast. He would have talked a big game. He would have puffed out his chest and, and said, of course I love you. But over the last few weeks, Peter has matured. He's been humbled and he's grown. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter doesn't boast. He doesn't point to his own strength or his accomplishments. Gone is Peter's pride. That left on Thursday night when he denied Jesus and wept bitterly. Bitterly. The Peter after the resurrection is a humbled Peter. So when Jesus asks him, do you love me? And he's feeling grief. He doesn't say, look what I've done. He doesn't say, I've been with you for three years. He simply says, you know that I love you because you know all things. These are the words of a man who has matured, a man who has been made humble, a man who, knew, who now realizes his own weaknesses. This is a confession of a man who knows he can't point to his actions, only his heart. Andreas Kostenberger comments, perhaps at long last Peter has learned that he cannot follow Jesus in his own strength. And he has realized the shallowness of affirming his own loyalty in a way that relies more on his own power of will than on Jesus' enablement. Likewise, we should soundly distrust self-serving pledges of loyalty today that betray self-reliance rather than a humble awareness of one's own limitations and acting on one's best intentions. What a dramatic change we're seeing in the apostle Peter. Before his failure, he was not fit for leading Christ's church. He was impulsive and he was brash. He was proud. He tried to kill a dude with a sword. I mean, it's crazy, Peter. But because Peter has failed, he's ready to be restored. He's now fit for the master's use. N notice how Peter's love for Jesus is manifested according to Jesus. Peter tells him, okay, I love you. Now feed my sheep. Uh, there are two terms here used interchangeably. Again, you've heard this sermon before. These bosco means to tend, to feed, to tend. Poimeno means to shepherd, take care of the sheep, to rule, to lead. You know, there's, as if there's something there, there's not. They're, they're interchangeable, so we'll just leave it at that. The idea here is clear. The expression of Peter's love is not mere talk. It's not boasting or proclamation or trying to kill a guy. Peter shows his love for Christ by taking care of of Christ's church. Peter shows his love for Christ by pastoring Christ's people. Uh, just because I have to, J.C. Ryle comments here, uh, very, very, it's beautiful. He says, usefulness to others is the grand test of love and working for Christ, the great proof of really loving Christ. It is not loud talk and high profession. It is not even impetuous, spasmatic zeal in readiness to draw the sword and fight. It is steady, patient, laborious effort to, good, to do good to Christ's sheep scattered throughout the sinful world, which is the best evidence of being a true-hearted disciple. This is the real secret of Christian greatness. Peter's recommissioning was to pastoral ministry. Gone were the days of zealous proclamation and cutting off a guy's ear. Now Peter would give the rest of his life to caring for God's people. Peter would feed God's sheep. He would shepherd them, take care of them. And, and pastoring is both of those things. It, it isn't just teaching, it's, it's shepherding. Uh, it isn't less than teaching. I mean, a lot of shepherding is what's going on right now. Like I study on Red Mountain Pass and read these ridiculous commentaries and I tell you the, the meaning. And that's part of it, that's part of it. But a faithful pastor is one who feeds, who guides, who protects. Um, I'm going to name names. I'm going to call out people. Um, not you guys. Well, maybe if you're sinning. But, um, you know, I have no qualms about, about false teachers and 
telling you their name from here and what they teach. That's my job. That's what a pastor does. Uh, the reformer John Calvin, he says, a shepherd should have one voice for the sheep and one to ward off the wolves. I mean, that's, that's typical. Paul is later going to name Peter uh, and call him out publicly. I mean, this is the pattern for false teachers. That's all part of pastoring. But pastoring is also shepherding, being with the sheep. He spends time with his people caring for them. Jesus himself, the great shepherd, is the example of what pastoral ministry looks like. And, and we see this in John 10. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door by the door is the shepherd of the, the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has been brought all out all of his own, he goes before him, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. In, in verse 11 of John 10, Jesus further explains what pastoral ministry should look like. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The Apostle Paul would later tell Timothy that the aim, the telos is the word, the, the goal, the end, the purpose, the outcome of ministry is love. In 1 Timothy 1.5, the aim of our charge is love. The purpose of our gospel ministry is is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Pastoral ministry is about love. The expected outcome, the goal of ministry is love. Love on the part of those being shepherded, which would be you, and love on my part as I shepherd the sheep. Peter would eventually come to understand this. In his first letter, he describes what faithful pastoring looks like. And, and I want you to listen to what he says because it reveals how much Peter has changed. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, he will re receive, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Notice that Peter does not say, hey, as your pope, I exhort you to do this. No, he says, as a fellow elder, as a fellow pastor, Tell, I'm telling you to shepherd God's flock, to take care of God's people, not under compulsion, not because you have to, because you're guilty, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain. That means you're not in ministry for money. That would disqualify so many of these, these, these fools on TV. Um, you don't go into ministry for money. And probably if you're doing ministry faithfully, you're not going to have much money, I'm guessing, right? That's typical, okay? You're not doing it for money. You're doing it eagerly, not domineering over those people. Pastor is not supposed to dominate you, but to be an example. Peter had failed Jesus. His ministry had ended in total failure. Worse than that, his ministry ended with outright denial of Jesus, and that is the worst case scenario for the gospel preacher. Fewer things shake the faith of believers more than seeing a pastor that they've looked up to disqualified from ministry or even worse, renounce Christ. Peter did both. He tried to kill a guy in the same night. He tried to kill a guy for Christ and then he denied Christ. This is so, Peter, think about the scene. You're standing, remember, with a Roman cohort. It's like 600 Roman soldiers there. You're standing there with the 12 of, well, the 10 of you. And in front of a literal army, Peter picks out a sword and tries to kill a dude to defend Jesus. That's insane. A couple hours later, he, he goes into the, the, the high priest's house, and a little servant girl, probably in her late teens, says, aren't you with him? And he denies him. Like, that's Peter. Face off an army 
but cower before a little girl, right? That he, total collapse. Th- this passage uh, is so sweet for pastors. It, it, it's sweet to me. One of the hardest experiences of my life was being removed from pastoral ministry. And one of the greatest joys of my life is experiencing what Peter here experiences, being restored to pastoral ministry. There's hope here. There's forgiveness here. There's learning here. And we see this with Peter. And, 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 and my removal, you're probably wondering, what are you talking about? My removal from ministry, I wasn't trying to kill somebody. Um, or <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't deny Christ. I didn't get anyone pregnant. It's nothing like that, okay? <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it was an unjust situation. And um, other elders at another church affirmed that. So it wasn't a fault of my own. Uh, ministry is, a, is brutal because people are sinners, Okay? It's, it's no coincidence, this is so funny, that Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, he, he talks about all of the horrible things that he has experienced in ministry. And at the very end of the list, he talks about the church. He, he says, he was imprisoned. Listen, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I was imprisoned. I was beat. I was whipped. I was stoned. I was shipwrecked. I was imprisoned. I was starving. I was in danger from animals. I was in danger from this and that. And you think, man, Paul, could it get worse? Yes, because at the very end, he says, on top of all of that, was the pressure of the churches. Like the worst punishment Paul had was God's people. They're horrible. They are, and you, you, you know this. If you go to church, you know they're horrible because... You're horrible. The church is filled with sinful, fallen people. Of course we're going to get hurt. We think we're not, but this is the place you will get hurt. But there is restoration. This isn't the end for Peter, and it's not the end for you. That's what we're seeing this morning. Peter is given a second chance. He failed in ministry. He was proud. But he was humbled. And Jesus restores him. So Peter's time, brief, probably only a couple of weeks, his time on the sideline, it's over. It's time for Peter to get back on the horse, and to get back into pastoral ministry. We've seen his commission into ministry in verse 15 through 17. Let's look at his calling in verse 18 through 23. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he, show, he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Pa- following his recommission to ministry, and before Peter is even given a chance to speak, which is wise on Jesus' part, Jesus tells Peter what his future holds. What initially seems like a prophecy about Peter growing old, you know, you used to dress yourself, but you're not going to. You used to walk where you wanted to, but now you're not going to. It turns dark quick. He says, you're going to stretch out your hands, someone else is going to dress you, and you're going to be carried to where you do not want to go. And in verse 19, we say, what is Jesus talking about? And John anticipates that, so he tells us. This cryptic prophecy on Jesus' part is clearly a reference to the crucifixion. When someone was crucified, their arms were literally stretched out. 
Another person would dress you or undress you. They would strip you naked. And you are literally carried where you do not want to go. You're, you're, you're being carried to one of the worst imaginable deaths. I mean, who would want that? And you remember earlier, Jesus had made a promise to Peter on, on, on the night when Peter betrayed him. In John 13, 36, when Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. That's like uh, foreshadowing. And at that time, Peter could not follow Jesus into death by crucifixion, but he would later on. For 30 years, Peter lived under a death sentence. Think about that. Like his Lord, Peter would, ha- would live under the shadow of the cross. For 30 years, he did pastoral ministry knowing that it would end with his crucifixion. And while that's shocking and sobering, and you say, who would want to know how they're going to die? For Peter, it's reassuring. He had failed. He had publicly denied Jesus. And now Jesus gives him a guarantee he will never fail again. He will be faithful. He will never deny his master and he, he will never again publicly renounce Jesus. He will do gospel ministry faithfully to the end, so faithfully that he would die a martyr's death. He will in life glorify God and he will in death glorify God. Again, Peter understood that suffering for Christ was an occasion for blessing. Suffering in Jesus' name is a way for the follower of Christ to glorify Christ. In that same letter that we we quoted earlier in 1 Peter 4, he says this, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. So so Peter's saying, if if you suffer for Christ, this is good. If you suffer for being an idiot, don't, don't do that. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Church history reveals that the that Peter eventually makes his way to Rome with the Apostle Paul. And after the great fire of Rome in In 64, Nero would blame Christians for burning down the city, and he would begin persecution. And here, Peter and Paul would both meet their martyrdom. As a Roman citizen, Paul was not permitted to be crucified, so he was beheaded. But Peter, being a Jew, didn't have that privilege, and he was crucified. According to church tradition, an elderly Peter was crucified upside down. So from this recreating, this recommissioning, and this recalling into gospel ministry, Peter would remain faithful all the way to the end. And once more, Jesus ends this commission and this guarantee of perseverance with the command, follow me. These were among the first words recorded that Jesus spoke to Peter. Peter. Peter, in, in, in John 1, Peter tells the, the group of men to follow him. And when beginning his formal ministry, you know, sometimes we think like um, Jesus meets Peter and then they, it's like, boom, they follow. That's not how it goes. He says, follow me. You know, you, I'm changing your name to Peter. And then later on, right, later on, um, as Jesus begins his public ministry, he, he finds Peter where he finds him in our text this morning, Sea of Galilee. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Do you, it's so obvious, but do you, do you see what's going on here in this passage? This isn't some nonsense about phileo and agape, That's This is Peter being recommissioned. And Jesus is recreating the scenes. When Jesus first calls Peter into gospel ministry, he's fishing at the Sea of Galilee. And now when he recalls him into gospel ministry, he is fishing at the Sea 
of Galilee. Peter's getting a second chance. And it's like nothing ever happened. It's all past. Jesus is recreating, recommissioning, and recalling him. And it would be a mistake this morning to look at this passage as simply being a message to pastors. We're we're in a unique, unique situation this morning at Higher Ground where we have several pastors here and a pastor who's teaching our kids right now in training, right? And this passage is powerful and relevant for pastors. And you, even if you're not in formal ministry, it's not as if you're, you're not a pastor still. You just have that heart. And, and we've, we've seen that, you know. But the truth of it is that all of us, pastor and non-pastor alike, are called. If you are a Christian, you are called. In 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, Peter Saint, this same Peter tells Christians, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the elex, elec, elec, excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you, were not, once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Your being a Christian fundamentally means you were called out of the darkness and put in with a bunch of other called people. And you know what we call that group of people who've been called out? We call them the ecclesia, which means called out ones. Ecclesia translated from Greek into English is church. Church, this, being with God's people. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 will tell us to walk in a way that's worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Well, how do we do that? In verse 2 of Ephesians 4, Paul tells us, right after he says, you walk worthy, Christian, you walk worthy of your calling, he says, here's how you do it. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So, So Paul says, live worthy of your calling. How do we do that? Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how. And then check this out. Ephesians 4 is so rich. This is the context. After telling us, after Paul tells us to walk worthy of your calling, and then he describes your calling as being a good brother and sister to your fellow brothers and sisters, he says this in verse 12. That, that, that gifts have been given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that way we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Do do you understand that? What Paul is saying is that you're to walk worthy of your calling. How do you do that? By being a good Christian to other Christians, by being committed to other Christians, by putting them first. What's the context for that? It's the local church. And then you as a Christian have been gifted. And you are to use your gifts in the context of a local church. And when that happens, Paul says, when you have a group of sinful Christians who have to get through a bunch of stuff together, when they are using their gifts to to edify one another, which is, you know, you glorify God, you edify the church, you testify the gospel, glorify, edify, testify. It's the church's purpose. When you are edifying other believers through your gifts, what happens is the body is building itself up in love. A healthy church is a church where its members are actively doing ministry. And unfortunately, there are many churches in our day who preach against membership because they have no idea what they're talking about. Membership is your submission, according to Hebrews, to a local body of elders and is your submission to brothers and sisters in Christ. So these these people say, oh, well, there's no membership in the Bible. Well, if you're looking for like membership like Sam's Club, no, there's no membership in the Bible. But is is there a call for you to submit to your pastor? Yeah, 
You got to have a pastor to submit to it. Is there a call to submit to your brothers and sisters? Yes. And where do you find them? The church. It's not rocket science. So there's membership. And so often we view ministry as the pastor's job. He's, it's his responsibility. He's the professional. But the New Testament has no such vision of the church. The pastor's job is to equip the saints. That's you. And the saints then are called to do gospel ministry. The church I was raised at, shaped at, Grace Baptist Church, has a, in its bulletin a slogan, every member, member a minister. That's exactly right. And as you leave the building, I believe if my memory is fading, if I lie this morning, Ricky, don't tell anyone, but if I, I haven't been in there in forever, but I believe when you're leaving the church, there's a sign that says uh, something like you're now entering the mission field. Am I making that up? It's not? Kellen says yes. Is it gone? Maybe you don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm kidding. I think there are, Kellen says yes, so I think so. There's something about, okay, maybe it wasn't Grace. Somewhere I've been to had that. <laughs> At any rate, that's exactly right. We live in a Christian culture that divides the secular and the sacred. The truth is there, there is no such division. When you're following God, your vocation is your calling and it is sacred. One of the contributions of the reformers is the idea of quorum Deo, that we're, we're living all of life in God's presence. The idea is that what we do, whether it be home or church or work, it's all done as, God's, as an act of worship to God. In other words, what I'm saying this morning is that if you are a Christian, you are called, and your calling is to grow in holiness. Your call is to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ in the context of a local church. Peter was called to pastoral ministry, and you were called as well. Some of you to pastoral ministry, and some of you to IT or nursing or to working on a drilling rig. And all of it, though, you are responsible for growing in holiness and ministering in the context of of a local church. So Peter's ministry was bookended by the command to follow him. When Jesus first called him into ministry, he was commanded to follow him. And after being in ministry and failing in ministry and being restored to ministry, Jesus once again commands him to follow him. There, is, there are several highlights from Peter's ministry. His calling, his confession of Jesus as the Messiah, his bold preaching on the day of Pentecost, his recommissioning into ministry, which we're seeing this morning. There is incredible tenderness and thoughtfulness here. Jesus has taken a man who will lead the church. He has recreated the setting of his calling and falling to reaffirm his calling and recommissioning him into ministry. Jesus has given Peter a second chance and he's assured him that he will never fall again. He would remain faithful to the end. It's touching and it's beautiful. And if this was a movie, the music would crescendo with Peter having tears in his eyes, shaking with emotion, tightly hugging Jesus, all while the sun glows behind them on the Sea of Galilee. The camera would slowly zoom out and you would take in this beautiful panorama, and the credits would roll. You see it, right, don't you? But life is not a movie, and that's not how Peter reacts. Peter reacts in the most hilarious way imaginable. Look at verse 20. Peter turned, I mean, again, touching, emotional, you know, just Jesus is so thoughtful, recreating everything to just, to, get, to recreate the calling and the falling, to restore him and recall him. It's, it's incredible. Jesus goes through all of this. And he's restored. And look at, look, at, look at this guy's response in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the other disciple whom Jesus loved following them. That's the apostle John, which we get further details. The one who had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, Lord, who, who is going to betray you? So verse 21, right? Beautiful, sweet recommissioning. Peter's response, verse 21. When Peter saw him, because John's right behind them. When Peter saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this guy? Like, <laughs> the apostle John had obviously followed Peter, and, bought Peter and, and Jesus. And after Jesus tells Peter his future, a guarantee of faithfulness to the end, Peter turns and there's John. And Peter just heard, like, you're going to die in one of the worst ways possible. And then he looks at John and says, 
What about him? <laughs> it's, isn't this the most Peter human? Un, un, like, it's just Peter going full Peter. You're telling me I'm going to die in the worst way imaginable, but what about this guy? And that's not, that's not how Peter's supposed to react. He's supposed to react the way I described. Music, crescendoing, shaking, crying, tight embrace, um, glowing sun, fading panorama, but that's not what he does. Earlier this week, I expressed to Val how hilarious I found this whole scene. I was studying, I was laughing, because Peter just is so true to himself. And, and this is how people are. You're, you're thoughtful, you put a lot of work into something, and they don't care. Like, they don't even recognize, they don't know. And they just react in a dumb way, and you just have to laugh. Like, it's how ministry's ruined is. So, the sweet moment is now ruined, right? All of that thoughtfulness on Jesus, it's gone now. It's ruined. Peter messed it up. So Jesus abandons any pretense of gentle restoration, and in verse 22, he goes full rebuke. Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remains until I come again, what is it to you? You follow me. In other words, what do you care? If I want him to come back, if I want him to live until I return, that's none of your business. You follow me. Peter falls into the trap that all of us are guilty of from time to time, looking at other Christians, comparing ourselves. Pastors especially do this. Uh, I love going to pastors' conferences and being with other pastors, but this is really one of the most annoying things. We're small talk, and we all have this pretense, oh, bless God, you know. So how many are you running? That's always the question. I'm like, you just stop it, right? Um, We do this all the time. We compare our walk with the Lord with other Christians, our churches with the other churches, our ministry to other ministry, our calling and the other calling. And Jesus says to Peter, and he says to us, what does it matter to you? You follow me. You keep your eyes on me. Peter would live a life of pastoral ministry and die a martyr's death. John would live a life of ministry and witness. And he would play an integral part in the early church through the written gospels, letters, and revelation. Both men were used mightily for the spread of the gospel. And John just includes a little note that because of this, um, some people believed, because of what Jesus said, some people believe that Peter or John would not die. Um, and, and, and he clarifies that's not what Jesus said at all. John was an old man at the time of writing this gospel. He's probably in his 80s or 90s. We learned from the church father Irenaeus that the apostle John lived until the emperor Trajan. And Emperor Trajan reigned from 98 to 117. So if Andreas Kostenberger is correct, he's the guy I quoted earlier, and Jesus is crucified and resurrected in AD 33, what that means is that John lives at least 65 years after this beachside conversation in John 21. Well, now that Peter has been restored, and the Apostle John has clarified that he's not going to live forever, and Peter's messed up the moment, the Apostle John is ready to bring his gospel to a conclusion. In closing both our sermon and our series, let's look at verse 24 through 25. Verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John now identifies himself as the author. Throughout the gospel, he's referred to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved, and now he states he is the author of the gospel. By the time of his writing this gospel, the church has been in existence for around 60 years. And the Apostle John is the last of the 12. They've all died. And John has witnessed it all from the beginning. Anyone reading his gospel could go talk to him and ask him what it was like to be around Jesus. He says it's true. I saw it. I wrote it all. And interesting enough, he says that we... We know his testimony is true. Who is the we? Again, commentators offer a whole bunch of ideas. None of them are any good. I'm of the opinion that he's talking about the church. The church, which was created through Peter's confession, that or Thomas's confession that Jesus is Lord, through the gospel message, attests to the truthfulness of John's gospel. That was the case then, and that's the case now. The word of God is powerful. It speaks authoritatively. If you're a Christian, if you believe that Jesus is Lord and God, if you confess that, if you've repented of your sin, if you've submitted to the Lordship of Christ, you can attest to John's testimony. This is true. I 
know it. Your regenerated heart is in full agreement with it. Now look with me at verse 25. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John once more clarifies that his gospel is not a full record of Christ's life. It's not even a standard Greco-Roman biography. In the previous chapter, the technical conclusion of John's gospel, he tells us that he picked certain things to prove an agenda. It was, you know, some people are like, oh, the, these Bible writers, they're not, they're not uh, writing history. They have an agenda. Yeah, they tell you they have an agenda. Like, well, what is this? You think you're onto something new? I mean, yeah, they, they told, I'm not writing everything. I'm only telling you a few things so that you will believe. I mean, that's, that's nothing new. John, John now tells us that all the books in the world cannot contain what Christ has done and what Christ has said. In the prologue at the very beginning, John reveals that through Jesus we have seen God's glory. And he, in John 1 14, he says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory is seeing the accomplishments of another person. We speak this way when we show people our homes or our spouse or our kids or our job or our accomplishments or, or if you come into my house and I take you into my library that I've been building since I'm a 15-year-old kid. Look at my glory. Here it is. You can't touch it. You can't pull it off the shelf. That's for me, but you can look at it. Look at it. Um, what Jesus does and says is summarized by those two words. It's his glory. What's his glory? It's grace and it's truth. Everything he's done, everything he said, grace and truth, his glory. Jesus came as light in a dark world. Jesus came as life to a dead people. He invites you to be born again, to be regenerated, to go from death to life. He calls you out of darkness and into light. Light and life. That is the gospel according to John. The gospel of John begins in glory and it ends in glory. The book opens in eternity past where Jesus Christ, the word, the living revelation of God, dwells in eternity with the Father and the Spirit. And it ends here in John 21 with John's confession that the world cannot contain the life and ministry of Christ. The world was created by the word. And the world cannot contain all of the words about the word. Let's pray. Father, we have seen an incredible text here. We have seen the rest of the story with someone that you picked to lead your church fall, to have his ministry end in total failure, and we've seen your thoughtfulness in the beauty of restoration. Father, for anyone in here this morning who is feeling like a Peter who has fallen, I ask that they would see your offer of restoration this morning. For your church, Father, I ask that you would, that, that you would impress upon everyone in this room this morning that ministry is not just for pastors, it's for all of us. All of us are called to minister. Father, with, with all the people this morning here, I ask that you would impress upon them their need to become members of a local church, to pledge their, their submission to a group of pastors and to pledge their submission to your people in that context, that they would, they would recognize that there is no there is no standard there is no expectation that christians would just attend a service and that's it but that they would do ministry to build up their bodies their brothers and sisters and to testify your gospel father we thank you for this epic beautiful conclusion to john's gospel that all the world itself cannot contain the words about the word we love you and we thank you in christ name i pray amen <laughs>